Hello, I'm Michael Pearson. This is The Human Condition. Today's lecture is about bile and indigestion and imbalances and digestive processes in mostly adults, but older kids, not the little babies. When we discussed further, and in the past we discussed stomach acid and we discussed bile as a problem. We talked about how stomach acid is released in the stomach and it digests protein and minerals and it usually happens within the first three hours of eating because that's how long it takes for the stomach to churn and empty. After three hours of eating, after a proper full meal size uh, food uh, serving, the bile kicks in, the stomach is emptied, and the food moves from the stomach into the small intestine. In the small intestine, the emptying of the stomach signals the gallbladder to pump out bile that goes into the small intestine and meets the food there that came from the stomach. So they meet from two different places in the small intestine, and the pH switches from very acidic from the stomach to very alkaline in the small intestine. And the, the switch of that pH is clearly caused by the bile, which is very alkaline, very much like the lye that you might use in cleaning your, your household, lye, sodium hydroxide lye, L-Y-E. So that's what happens in the small intestine. And when the, that bolus of food, or what, what's called chyme, that mixture of partially digested material hits the small intestine, there can be some gases produced. And those gases might constitute methane, although more methane is produced in the large intestine, but you can produce methane and, and carbon dioxide and hydrogen in the small intestine too. And those will go into the general circulation and come out the lungs in your breath. They can give you bad breath. They can also come out in flatulence, which of course is another kind of bad breath. <laughs> and they can also end up, not usually, but they, you can have belching or, or burping coming from the stomach, but not usually from the small intestine. If you had belching from the small intestine, it would not be very pretty because the gas from the small intestine would have to make it up through two sphincters, the bottom sphincter of the stomach and the top sphincter of the stomach, which are normally sealed, and go all the way up and out your mouth. So that's not likely to happen. Most gas that you belch or burp up comes from your stomach, not from your small intestine. But your breath that comes out of your lungs very much could be gas that was dissolved in your bloodstream and collected from your small intestine, and that's pretty gross. That's one of the reasons that people can have some pretty bad smelling breath that can sometimes be methane-y and, and fecal-like because that's where the gas comes from. It dissolves in their bloodstream, gets carried into their lungs and exchanged, and that gas comes out, and that's, um, that's a source of methane breath. We talked earlier and said that irritable bowel syndrome is largely produced by disorders of bile production, and bile is really important. In fact, a lot of literature shows that bile salts there are primary and secondary bile salts. You release primary bile salts from your gallbladder and you manufacture them in your liver and pancreas. And then later on in the small intestine, the processing and the exposure to the chemistry of what's going on in the, in the tube of the intestine converts, if you're lucky, these primary bile salts into secondary bile salts. And then you reabsorb a lot of them. And it's really cool because the literature shows that these bile salts are actually neurotransmitters. They affect the brain powerfully and greatly, and, and that will be a, another lecture for us. But the, uh, the difficulty of bile and the, the lack of digestion of fats and proteins from, from bile insufficiencies creates uh, something sometimes called SIBO, which is that bloating effect that people have three hours or more after eating a meal. And what happens is their bile is insufficient or imbalanced or toxic and recycled bile, as we talked about in an earlier, earlier lecture, and that produces gas and fluid retention in, in the intestine. When the intestine is inflamed, it's very common for the intestine to gain two or three times its normal weight in water. So it'll bog from water, and then it will also swell from gas. So if you palpate it, you'll find that it feels boggy like fluid with your fingers as far as palpation, but it also has a gas a tumescence to it. It has a tension to it, like a full balloon with pressure in it. And so that pressure is caused by gas. And it will also give a sound called timpani. If you do percussion of a, an air-filled chamber in the body, it sounds like it's full of air. And if you do percussion in a non-air-filled body, like your dense arm, which shouldn't have any air in it, or your leg, which is a really good one. I like to use the leg a lot with my patients. I percuss their leg and I say, you hear that dull sound? That's what no air sounds like. That's what all fluid sounds like. But if there's air in a chamber anywhere in your body, it's going to echo, and that echo is called timpani. 
So we write in our physical exam that we noted tympani that's not supposed to be there. The only place you're supposed to have tympani is, of course, your nasal sinuses and your mouth and the meganblas, which is the air bubble in your stomach, and that's supposed to be there and it's golf ball sized. Sometimes when we x-ray people, we can see that the meganblas is enlarged or smaller than normal, and that'll help guide us into what our patient might need or, or not need. Nevertheless, when we get back to the small intestine and the gallbladder, we know that we have a gallbladder problem when we have things like irritable bowel syndrome, we have intermittent constipation and diarrhea where the patient says, I just go back and forth from one to the other. I get constipated, then I get diarrhea, then I get constipated. I have inconsistent bowel movements. That's a very common sign of, of gallbladder problems. It is very common for people to have SIBO and gallbladder problems with stomach acid problems. However, some people can just have a stomach acid problem and not a gallbladder or bile problem. I think you'll see that a lot more, a lot more often. So if somebody, you know, for example, takes stomach acid helpers like lemon juice or lime juice or raw apple cider vinegar with their meals, they take zinc lozenges and they do proper food combining for themselves um, as a temporary solution, meaning they, they just eat meat without a bunch of pasta, without a bunch of grains, without a bunch of vegetables, and they, they do this, what's called in the literature, food combining, which is actually food separating, and they still don't get better. They still have symptoms within three hours uh, and beyond after a meal. They have bloating. They have increase in, in girth of their abdomen down at the waistline, not up here, but down at the waistline. That's a small intestine problem, and it's usually related to the gallbladder too. So it's not just a stomach acid problem. Sometimes these people have floating stools. Sometimes these patients will have stools that are, that are green in color or yellow in color, and that's bile. That bile often burns when it comes out. It will, it will burn the rectum, and it, and it hurts. It is something that can cause fissures and tears in the anus and rectum. This is a, a problem for anywhere from, from children and babies all the way up to elderly adults. Everyone can experience this and, and may go through this. It, it doesn't usually produce the kind of constipation that, that causes hemorrhoids. That comes from other types of things, but it can contribute to, to making those worse in the episodes when the person is going through a constipation event. Gallbladder problems usually are more small stools. We call them rabbit stools because they're little balls of stool instead of a long line. Humans should have kind of a log as opposed to little stones or little stools like a rabbit would or deer or other animals that, that have circular stools. So if you see a lot of circular stools or a lot of broken stools that are in little pieces or formless or even liquid but not quite diarrhea, that could be a gallbladder problem. It doesn't have to be yellow. It doesn't have to be green. It can be the normal brown color. You know, it, it's very commonly a, a bile insufficiency problem, which means they have a chronic problem that, mean, that needs liver and pancreas support in most cases. Now, once in a while, there is a more difficult problem where there is a blockage of the common bile duct or, or one of the ducts between the pancreas, the, the liver, and the gallbladder, and how the gallbladder empties out into the small intestine through the sphincter of Odi. These, this set of plumbing is not important for you to understand necessarily, just to realize that there's pipes between the pancreas and liver to the gallbladder and from the gallbladder out to the small intestine. And, and those few inches of piping can get stuck with gallstones. If a gallstone is tearing tissue and ripping tissue and causing bleeding or fully blocking the flow of bile, we can get an infection and die. And so it's, it's rare, but it's important to know that if you have that, the bile can't make it to the small intestine and the small intestine doesn't have the bile salts when the stool comes out. So you may not know this, but stool is, is technically white. When you digest your stool, it would be white until it meets bile because bile has all these pigments. And the brown color of stool comes from the pigments in the bile. So if you had a bile blockage, your stool would come out white in color. So if you ever see white stools in children or adults or infants, it's a pretty much a medical indicator that means get that person checked out right away. Do not wait because that indicates a blockage of bile in the intestinal system, and it can lead to an infection, it can lead to death. So we really wanna make sure we check that out and understand if the patient needs a, a gallbladder surgery or, or removal of that blockage because it can be a medical emergency and it's medically necessary. Now, how do we help these gallbladders and help this bile? You can buy non-GMO soy lecithin. There are not the same genistein and diadzean compounds in pure uh, lecithin. So a person can have that without the hormone effect and the, the fears of, of cancer effects and estrogenic effects of soy. You can also get uh, non-soy lecithin. 
It's a little bit harder to get, but there are other sources of vegetable lecithin. Lecithin comes in two forms. It comes in granular, which is like little yellow styrofoam balls, and they don't dissolve too well in water or juice, but they kind of do. The most common way that my patients take it is they drink it in water or juice, and they just drink the, the lecithin. Lecithin also comes in a liquid, which is very runny, and it, it looks a lot like snot. It's pretty disgusting. It's clearish to white, and it's um, kind of a, a liquid, but it, it's very viscous and, and thick, so um, it's pretty gross texture. Although the, the taste and flavor is, is completely fine, but the, the texture is pretty awful for a lot of people, so that a lot of my patients don't use liquid lecithin. Although it works great for cooking purposes, it works great for various cooking and baking and mixtures, for oral applications, for taking it by mouth as a supplement, you can also buy less than in capsules, but you'd have to take a fairly large number of capsules to get the less than you need because we're talking about a tablespoon or two, and that's a lot of capsules. So some people want to take the capsules and some people want to take the spoonful, dissolve it in a glass of water or iced tea and just drink it. Now you'll still taste and feel the less than granules, and they're a bit soapy and a bit greasy, mostly a bit uh, waxy, as I guess the, the best explanation is waxy. And so they're not the best tasting, but they will really help because once again, 94% of bile is lecithin. So getting enough lecithin is really important to making bile. And then there is ox bile supplements that people can take. It's very helpful and very useful. And there are a number of herbal formulas that are over the counter that will help induce the production of bile. But you know, without lecithin, it doesn't make a lot of sense to stimulate the production of something without having the actual bricks for the bricklayer to lay the bricks and make the wall. So you need the raw materials of the lecithin since it's 94% lecithin. When a person begins to have better stools, that is your key that their gallbladder is starting to improve. And one of the things that we look for with a person who has not so sick of a body that they have white stools and a blocked bile duct, but not so well as to be just pretty much normal, this is the patient in between. This is the chronically ill person and they can actually have something that is called chronic pancreatitis. Chronic pancreatitis is very different than acute pancreatitis, although it can look very similar. Acute pancreatitis is a medical emergency, and it kills about 10% of people that get it. So it's a medical emergency, and you really need to go to the doctor if you have acute pancreatitis. But there are many people that have this chronic pancreatitis. And so this chronic pancreatitis does not kill you. It takes a long time to get it, and it takes a long time to heal it. And it looks kind of like this. The person is usually thin. They're usually very malnourished. They are nervous. They're hungry like crazy and they want to eat. They eat large boluses of food and they feel better. And then they feel pain. They feel pain in their abdomen. They feel pain across their pancreas and, and liver and gallbladder. They often have burning and itching around their, their uh, liver and gallbladder. They can have skin lesions around their area of their abdomen, the upper, upper abdomen, lower chest. Uh, around their liver and gallbladder. They can have burning and itching and, and terrible stabbing pains, and they feel like they're dying or they want to die. And then they don't want to eat. They'll say, well, I, the longer I go without eating, the better I feel. If I fast, I feel great. But sooner or later, I'm hungry and I want to eat. And when I'm hungry, I'm hungry. And they eat like a horse. And then, of course, the cycle starts over again. Because what they have is insufficient bile, insufficient stomach acid, the inability to make bile from their pancreas, they have a pancreatic insufficiency and probably a liver insufficiency too, and they can't make the enzymes they need, they can't make the bile salts they need, and they can't digest the food they eat, so they rent it. These people eat food and they rent it. It goes through from one end to the other and comes out, and they don't absorb the nutrients. And so they lose weight and lose weight and lose weight. They get this cachexia, and it's a really bad wasting. And you want to measure their body fat percentage. We want to make sure that we, we measure their body fat percentage. We don't want to see you know, men below 5% body fat, and we don't want to see women below 12 to 15% body fat, because it's not about the pounds and it's not about BMI. Body mass index is really a statistical measure used for herds of people and animals. It's not designed for individuals. So I don't like body mass index as much as I like things like other statistics that we can measure, like this body fat percentage of an individual. So we want to give herbs, we want to give minerals like magnesium and zinc to help with healthy bile. We want to give very useful the, the amino acid L-taurine. We want to make sure that the patient has ox bile and lecithin. We want, want to make sure that they have small meals that they can digest and not large meals. We want to make sure they're eating frequently enough to do this. And in fact, those chronic pancreatitis patients, if they go to the hospital, they'll get tested. They'll be told they don't have chronic pancreatitis. 
they'll be told they don't have acute pancreatitis, uh, given an IV because they're usually so deficient at that point, they're, they're given an intravenous line. Then they'll be sent home with a diet and they don't understand the diet and they can't follow it and they don't know what to do. So they'll need to take exogenous enzymes. They'll need to take oral enzyme formulations for a period of time and they'll need to eat small meals. There is another test that's very useful in, in chronic pancreatitis, which is fecal chymotrypsin. A fecal chymotrypsin test can help us determine if there's a problem with this chronic pancreatitis by testing how much chymotrypsin makes it into the feces. That is the beginning understanding of the difference between stomach acid problems and bile and gallbladder problems. Everyday inflammation and everyday imbalances can be discerned by physical examination, and that will be our next lecture. <laughs>